Okay, we've already had the question, who in the audience is a Star Wars fan? Now, this isn't just to, <laughs> this isn't just to see how eager you all are and how interested you will actually be in this content. It's to kind of prove a point. So, first off, who owns either a tablet or a smartphone? Seems like a stupid question, but can I see a show of hands? Okay, now keep your hands up. That, you were quick to put them down. Keep your hands up if you are also a Star Wars fan. Okay, so that... That's a good segment of an audience. Now, normally when you come into something, you, unless it was a specific conference, and that's not, a, that's not generalized for the population, the consumers at large. Now, Star Wars mixed with mobile, mixed with digital, mixed with all of the things that we do day to day is a brilliant winning brand. And we're kind of, I'm gonna show you today something that, okay, this is a little different to your regular startup, but essentially this is something that almost feels like its own ecosystem, something that could be a, a startup on its own. Um, now, what I'd like to start with is to kind of show you some of the things that we do. So, very much alluded to at the start there, this is a massive moving wall of fun content from the Guinness World Records to Doctor Who to The Doors to Led Zeppelin to contemporary artists to the kind of the big blockbuster movies of the day. Now, we tackle all of this um, and we tackle all of the slightly less interesting stuff that goes on in the background to make sure it all works. Um, but it's the fact that we know how it all works under the skin that makes the entertainment, that makes the engagement for an audience that much better. So you are actually, you know, we're thinking about the journey that you take on this. Um, so now the piece in the center there is actually the video that we created prior to iPad launching and being announced. Because a big part of what I do now is really very much on the innovation front. Now that's, innovation is a great word to band around and a lot of people use it, but essentially the way that we term that is, is thinking ahead for, for an audience, thinking ahead for a client. And most often we'll be thinking 12, 24 months ahead about emerging technology, about relevant technology. Um, you know, some of that is steering your clients away from what they should be doing, but a big chunk of that is saying, look, this is where your audience will be in 12 months, 24 months time. And this exactly is what you should be delivering for them. Um, and, you know, very proud of saying we've got a 100% hit rate on that. That ain't going to last forever. We'll, we'll, make, we'll play a few curveballs. But essentially, what that means is, for a designer, and that's my background, it means we are genuinely designing the future. Um, now, normally that's something to say, oh, can you predict the future? Well, you can't. But if you know what is going to happen at key points, what's going to launch, what kind of platforms that looks like, that's a great way to target content, to target campaigns, to target the way that your consumers you know, the way that they digest your content. So this is essentially the visual way of, of our thinking behind innovation. If you've got some sound, it may well just entertain us in the background. That doesn't bode well for Star Wars. Star Wars, the new silent movie. with something like um, our partnership with Lucasfilm and Disney. Now, the, the big step came for us with this project, and this is, we're talking today about Star Wars Scene Maker. Um, the big step came when Disney bought Lucasfilm. Um, now, we've worked with Disney for a number of years now, and, and it's been, you know, initially that starts out like a kid in a candy store, and you're thinking, I remember some of these things, you know, um, I've still kept in touch with the brands, the things that they make. But the most interesting thing has been their purchases over the last three, five years from Marvel to obviously Lucasfilm to Pixar. You know, they're brilliant strategic purchases, but of course, the fact that you suddenly, this adds to your portfolio, stunning stuff to work with. So this was our partnership essentially, working with these two and Brownwith. Um, and that was where we came for teamwork. So, you know, essentially our first kickoff meeting, this was the first time you know, we were, we're based in London and Windsor in the UK and we have an LA office, but we were essentially, the, the creative team was based in the UK for our first kickoff conference call. Now this was a video call that it's the first time that we've used a laser gun in a conference call. 
Um, now, it wasn't a real laser. We didn't kill anyone, didn't shoot, and didn't harm anyone. But this was the first time we've had kind of license to shoot someone in, in mid-conversation. And, and that was the great, you know, that, that kind of collaborative approach was the way things were kicked off because everyone sat around that table to varying degrees was as you were when you put your hands up to say you were Star Wars fans. They were genuinely Star Wars fans. You know, we don't tell anyone else within the business, we kind of would have done this for nothing. This was great stuff. Um, so, you know, scene maker, Star Wars scene maker was unleashed a year ago. Now, I had the pleasure of speaking at Bitspiration last year, and I had the double pleasure of also announcing the arrival of scene maker at Bitspiration. Uh, and that was, that was so exciting because we'd been working on this project for kind of six to eight months and we hadn't been able to tell a soul. And of course, you know, I can tell you about that excitement around that table. You know, that excitement was a hundredfold by the time we were ready to launch. And we just wanted to tell everyone, and we finally could. Um, so what that gave us, so plan A. Now, throughout the process, this app changed considerably. Now, the original idea for plan A was um, we were gonna take the Kenobi Ranch um, and we were going to look at all of the history and the reference material and the depth of content there. And not just about, you know, the, the, the technical piece of it. It was about the detail in things like model making. Um, you know, the, you know, all of that was detailed. All of that was fascinating stuff. But it's not just, you know, again, not just a reference piece. It's about how do you immerse yourself in that? How do you learn the background and the skills behind model making? How do you create the music from scratch? Um, and how do you look at the scripting and the original kind of the way the whole thing was directed and the special effects? So, you know, that was the, the kind of work we've done for things like Doctor Who and The Doors. That's been very much a piece of reference material. Um, and along the way, we looked at all of this from the model making. Again, you could actually mold the, the models and you could do things like that. Um, but we actually took a we actually took a different turn where we started to look at things like the um, the scenes themselves. Um, the thoughts began to change about how and what we would produce. Um, so we had Plan B, which was actually going to be dedicated to Jar Jar Binks. Um, not really, not really. Um, <laughs> Plan B, uh, the result of saying well, actually we'll take a we'll take a different different tack here. We'll we'll, um, we'll take a different route. And this brainstorm resulted in. You know, wouldn't it be great if you could put yourselves in the shoes of George Lucas or J.J. Abrams and begin to create or recreate those classic scenes? Um, so we went from something that was, you know, relatively flat and two-dimensional to something that actually, you know, you felt you could delve into um, within the capabilities of a smartphone, a tablet. Um, so, you know, this was kind of how do you assemble the trench run? How do you create the models, how do you form something, how do you work with those characters that were in those iconic scenes. Um, you know, then drop in your own, very own titles within the, uh, the you know, the, the scrolling um, titles. Um, and then, you know, how do you start to think about that as various scenes? So, you know, obviously the, the really tough thing was to say, well, w you know, from iconic films, how do you then begin to separate out iconic scenes? Um, so we, you know, we took a view on that, um, and, and it really, this has all been about from the offset about how do you, how do you give an audience enough variety? Um, because of course they'll they'll eat up scene after scene after scene. But from the start and, and introducing a new audience to a certain extent, um, we wanted to keep that variety. So a big chunk of that was you know the content and the assets that we had at our disposal. So. You know, that's the cast. We've talked about um, the team, but actually, essentially, this was our digital virtual cast. So we had all the classics in there. Um, and then the fun bit, again, it's like boys with toys and, you know, kid in the candy store. We had access to all the models. Um, fascinating stuff when we're just given those as assets. But, you know, what do you start to do with that? What do you start to create? You start to create this. Now, this is the reveal that I've saved for Bitspiration this year, and this is the first full-length new trailer for Scene Maker.
So there we go. So reveal for today, I thought we'd save one up for Bitspiration as it's such a great conference again. Um, now, I'm incredibly proud of our team. Actually, I'm proud of my daughters, who were the two dressed up at the end there, who my poor, long-suffering daughters, who are always forced into doing all the things that I do. Um, they love it. They love it. Um, but yeah, I'm incredibly proud of the team. But actually, you know, we're, we're really proud of the audience. And, and I mean, that's most evident in the video community. Now, the app itself, so, you know, we, we give the audience the opportunity to recreate these scenes. Um, now, of course, the first thing you want to do is just kind of play around with that. And, and then the challenge is to see how close you can match that to what was, you know, iconic original scenes. But then the real fun comes when you can start to add your own spin to that. Um, so not only can you have this long list of the iconic, you know, Luke, I am your father, um, all of those phrases that we all know and love from the films, but actually when you start to revoice it and react it, so you're actually creating your own scenes. You know, this, the community that this essentially has been all shared on, on, on YouTube directly from the app, um, they're hilarious. Uh, most of them are comedy. Uh, there are very few that bother to share the iconic scenes anymore. They're all the fact that it's Darth Vader telling an Ewok he's his father. Um, it's, you know, that, that's, but that's where the fun comes. But also the, the technology allows us to then synthesize the voices. So you do actually sound like Darth Vader telling an Ewok he's your son. Um, but that's, you know, that's the beauty of the technology and the whole thing wrapped up together. So, you know, we're not only we're very proud of the teams that we've worked with, both Brownwith and Disney, but also, you know, the, the external team, the fact that this becomes a much, much bigger community and essentially the part of the Star Wars family. So, yesterday, I thought I'd have a look um, on the Polish App Store and, and see what rating we had over here and what kind of comments we had. Essentially, we had one rating of one star with one comment. And the comment, once I'd usefully dropped that into Google Translate, told me that you have to pay for everything. <laughs> um, it, that's kind of life. Um, now, the, the thing here is that the model that we built for Scene Maker was essentially the first scene is free. Um, so you get, you get that entire wrapper, you get the essence of Star Wars, and you get one scene for free. Um, then we, you know, we, we launched the scenes, and the scenes will be launching all the way in the run-up to the new film at Christmas and beyond. Um, and the, the way of doing that is that we were able to monetize each scene individually. So the choice is yours. You know, you can download the app for free, get one free scene, and beyond that, you can choose which scene you wish to customize. Um, but you know, we're used to these kind of comments. Um, I remember. One of our uh, rival developers, actually, TouchPress, or one comment that I read, um, they'd produced an app that was kind of showing you visually how 3D spinning objects looked uh, if, as if they'd been x-rayed. Now, one of the comments left behind was saying, I downloaded this app, but I couldn't x-ray anything. Yeah, that's because it was an app showing you pictures of x-rays. It didn't actually turn your iPad into an x-ray machine. Um, but these are the kind of things that we tend to contend with on the app stores. So, SceneMaker as an app. So that, you know, we've talked about the, the kind of things that you can do with SceneMaker for Star Wars. Now, again, this is why I come back to the point of looking at this as a startup ecosystem, an infrastructure. Um, because we looked at this as a framework. So essentially, you, you take Star Wars and you see how do you work that into other properties. So for example, we could look at something like the other classics, and, but the other series. So we look at something like Indiana Jones, um, the incredible Pixar environment, all of those fabulous films. Um, and then, of course, the, the Marvel Universe. So it's a slightly different environment simply because Star Wars in itself is a run of currently six films and on and on and on. And there is genuine iconic material there. But, you know, we've already found that the fun is in creating your own. Um, it gives you a basis to go on if you have a, a standard scene. But, you know, the audience is hungry for creating their own there. Now, future platforms. So my role these days is saying about innovation is about highlighting what future potential there are for any number of platforms. Uh, and for the likes of smartwatches, it's been 
three years, essentially, of dismissing more than recommending platforms because they've been poor. I mean, essentially, most smartphones barely function, smartwatches rather, barely function as watches, let alone smartwatches. Um, so we fortunately were able to have a, a view of, about Apple hardware um, and, and plan ahead and decide you know, what kind of things could happen for that. If, now, we haven't launched anything for Star Wars, but we did launch the, the Porsche app on, on day one so that you can control bits and pieces of your car, check on status and everything else. So we're not, we weren't only proud to launch on day one of iPad, but also on, on day one of Apple Watch. Um, but that itself lends to adding character. So, for instance, you look at watch faces, you look at the kind of things that expand from something like a, a central... Star Wars universe, and how do you apply that brand to other, other platforms? So you look at smartwatches. Um, now, also you look at something like virtual reality. Um, anyone that knows me will know that I've been talking about virtual reality for years now. Um, and everybody else has been waiting for virtual reality to actually become a reality. Um, we've had essentially the longest beta test, in public beta test in, I think, probably technical history. Um, and that's actually very, very useful because, the, one, the, the, the consumer and the public are very forgiving of content right now um, because they, they're not expecting all to be polished. However, there's only so much bad stuff you can do before people will be turned off before the thing arrives. Um, but we're finally getting to that place where things can arrive. So, you know, we're looking at the end of this year and the beginning of next year, all of the, the relevant platforms, and we're showing HTC here, and we've got Oculus Rift, um, Sony Morpheus, they will all start to sit in established environments for gaming, for short-form film, for, you know, the, the really intriguing content that you want to be utterly immersed in. So Star Wars is a great environment for that. Now, before we get to virtual reality, I want to talk about augmented reality. Um, and there's Alex actually already augmented up on screen there. Um, so the example here would be, now I couldn't bring everything with me through security, but for augmented reality, Star Wars environment is, is superb. Um, so you imagine that you're seeing your lightsaber in front of you in a real environment or you're seeing the trash can beaming the message from Princess Leia um, as if it was coming out of R2-D2. It's that kind of, again, quite fun things that you can do um, and combine that with physical environments. So lots of fun to be had with augmented reality. But it's virtual reality that I'm hoping, I say hoping, to demonstrate today simply because my phone has been restarting itself continuously and that was originally my controller. Um, however, I can still show you enough on screen if we can swap over to give you a little taster of some, some of the virtual Star Wars universe. Probably. Do you need me to do the voices or something? You do all the voices. Can try. <laughs> Your lack of faith is disturbing. Just, just before I do that, I'm going to show you my last three slides and then come back to this simply because I doubt that I can get back out of... I might just collapse on stage and be lost in the rift. Um, you know, essentially what we're going to look at is... Has the whole thing been skewed off screen? No, um, we're going to look at the trench run. You know, why would you not want to sit in an X-Wing fighter and attempt the trench run on the Death Star? I can think of no reason that. Um, and then secondly, which I know will be a relatively failed attempt at this, simply because my phone was meant to be the lightsaber, um, we were going to have a lightsaber duel with Darth Vader. However, let's just see what happens on that. And then finally, that has been me, because I'm unlikely to put that information back on screen again. And if you follow me on Twitter, all the links to all of this will be out there during the day from the video online to my entire presentation. 
Um, and then you can always download Digital Publishing The Next Steps from the iBook store. Right, that plug out the way. I'm going to go back to attempting riff. You can do your voices again now, Alec. <laughs> I can try Jar Jar Bean too. Shall we? Or someone knows how to chewy? How was your daughter doing that? It's not that deep. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, man. It's as I feared. You'll be able to see what I'm doing. However, I won't be able to see what I'm doing. This could be, this could be the shortest trench run in history. I may, have, I may have to cheat and just put it on my forehead. It's not quite the effect. Trust the force, Dean. Just trust the force, my friend. Bizarrely, you can actually see me dressed as Aptin America in, in the monitor on the screen of the, uh, the X-Wing, where I'm leaning into the... I'm, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so not using the force here. I'm going to do that again. the health and safety warning. So you, you've proven that you're not only extremely creative, you're an okay X-Fighter pilot. Just okay. Uh, th thanks actually for the compliment on that. <laughs> right, I'm, I'm going to attempt the lightsaber battle without the ability to use my limb. As you can see, I, I have a lightsaber with no arm control because my phone has died. Um, however, oh, <laughs> that's not right, is it? <laughs> 
I think I've, I think we've inadvertently created the first Star Wars porn. <laughs> so please feel free to come and test um, the rift on my, on my laptop afterwards if you want a closer, more intimate experience with Lord Vader. Uh, <laughs> if I lean in, no, I've got, well, no. On that note, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so I see that you also have done some stunts in the porn industry. Um, <clears throat> so if anyone has any business for him, please contact him. Uh, Dean.xxx, I'm sorry. So Dean, thank you very much. That was fantastic. Uh, you're an okay paddle, don't worry. <laughs> we, we don't hold it over you. Clearly, I'm better with a lightsaber. <laughs> so, questions, guys. Who has some questions? I'm not going to let you go out of this room without making questions, so let's just start. Who wants a lightsaber? <laughs> there we go. Hi, so uh, the question is how the descendant ma maker is a fan or can it disrupt uh, the film industry, for example? Um, the, s the film industry in general? <laughs> <laughs> like uh, newspapers and blogs, for example. So we have the blogs which make more money than newspapers today. Okay, well, the, the current state of the film industry is, is ro you know, if you'd asked me this question 12, certainly 24 months ago, it was going the way of all of the other media in industries. Now, what the big studios have done is essentially reverse that completely in the last 12 months. Um, you look at things like Jurassic Park making half a billion in, the, in its opening weekend. You know, we're, we're in the summer of blockbusters, so that's a little skewed. But essentially, by making the movies that the audience actually wants, um, rather than, you know, some of them are still formulaic, but there's some genuinely big blockbusters kicking things off. You know, Disney, again, being a client, this isn't the fact that I'm, they are a client, but it's just that that run up to Christmas, you know, the, the, the momentum behind Star Wars coming out in December is phenomenal. There's a new James Bond film out in November. You know, these are things that, again, 24 months ago, the same films wouldn't have, have had the same impact simply because it's a knock-on effect of lots of big, you know, not just big budget, but, you know, big firepower from scripting and quality films coming out. Um, now, you could say the same thing about, well, if we just made quality magazines or quality books or whatever else, why shouldn't that be the same thing? Um, and it's because we're in a generation now that's, you know, things are lining up just about right. So the generation that's willing to kind of spend money on streamed content or micro payments um, are looking for things outside of that. And because the film industry is doing so well by creating those products, the micro payment, the, the scene maker, it's drawing that audience back in again. Whereas, you know, the other areas, you know, you look at, yeah, you look at magazines and books and actually I mean, the, the publishing industry is healthier than the story it's telling. Um, but, you know, it, uh, it's still got a long way to go. They're not doing some of the things that they should do. And other people outside of that industry are essentially grabbing ground and publishing themselves. So, yeah, it's a different story now. Um, it's all healthy. It's all looking good. You see, they pay them. They pay him well <laughs> to say this kind of stuff. Yeah, just a quick question uh, regarding Occult's Rift, because. Uh, I've tried it a few times, and the biggest problem I think at the moment is that it makes you dizzy in two, three, five minutes. So how about that? What, what can we do to change it? Um, and well, the best solution I've seen to that is one that's not overly practical. So I mean, I've seen the odd-looking sex swing thing out there that I haven't seen yet. Um, but the, you know, there's some guys um, called Roto that have produced a motorized chair. Now that's not some kind of weird thing for people without the use of their legs. It's, it's the fact that you, you sit in this chair and it, and it reacts to whatever VR you're, you're looking at. Um, and, you know, I kind of saw this and thought, well, that's, it's a bit of a gimmick. 
Um, but what it does, and the main reason that you become motion sick within that environment is because if you're looking around, that's kind of fine. But if you're using a controller to turn yourself somewhere, that turns your environment around you. And that's just, that's unnatural. So if you're using a controller within a game, within anything you're doing, and your environment is, your, you know, the seat is actually turning with you, it, it, it just switches the motion sickness off straight away. But it adds another dimension as well, because it, it seems to add velocity and momentum to the experience. So, I mean, that's phenomenal. It's not a solution, because not everyone's going to have one of those in their house. But, um, you know, the, the steps that we've taken now, so there I was trying and failing to demonstrate the lean in with the camera at the top. Um, as soon as you move on again from a fixed perspective with something like Gear VR, um, you immediately feel as if you're more in that environment and you can, you can actually counter some of that motion sickness. So again, it's, it's still a relatively forgiving environment because they're not really commercially available, but as soon as they are, people are going to start to make those exactly valid criticisms. Another question. Come on, people. No questions, really? <laughs> we had the most awesome presentation so far. With a porn late lightsaber <laughs> and you know, crashing X-Wing, uh, uh, five-year-old Chewie. Yep. No one? Come on, guys. Well, meanwhile, I'll ask you a question. Um, what was the coolest part for you of doing this project, personally speaking? What was the, the one thing you were like, oh my god, I'm so horny right now, I'm touching myself? <laughs> I thought, uh, Vader was clearly enjoying it more than everyone else there. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing was that we, it was immersing ourselves with the teams that originally created this. So, so out in LA, we were sitting with the guys that worked on the original Star Wars movies that did the sound effects, that did the model making, you know. Uh, the, this, again, it's great to be able to show people what the, all of the background is behind what we've done here, because you just see that digital thing that appears. Um, but the, you know, the meeting of the people that go, oh, well, now, the, the lightsaber sound you're using there could go with up an octave, uh, just a touch. Um, it's not quite the way that I, and, and some, some of the time, it wasn't even them saying, it's not quite the way we had it in the movie. It's like, it's not quite the way I originally imagined it. Can we do it properly this time? Wow. Um, so, you, you, you know, that was, that was exciting. Um, Doesn't it burst the bubble, you know, knowing the real people behind it? And you go like, yeah. Well, kind of not, because, you know, again, clearly no allegiance to the client. The, the newest three films, because they were so heavily CGI'd, you kind of felt removed and you sort of wanted to go back to the old movies where they really used models and it actually was a Muppet Yoda. Um, all of those kind of things and it felt more real than him doing backflips and fighting with a lightsaber. Um, fortunately, come Christmas, we'll see the efforts of combining where we stand on that with real solid model making again and good CGI so it's not just pieces of crap put in there for the sake of it. Okay, so if we pay you enough, you can tell us how the movie is going to be? Mm, no. <laughs> it's just a matter of how much we pay you. <laughs> okay, questions, guys. Final questions. There we go. Well, it's clearly that you are at the front of all this new development and, and, and what's going on. When do you think that this is something that is going to be, let's say, available for the masses, meaning, you know, when do you think in one year, two years, three years, you know, Oculus, all this is going to be everybody involved? Well, I mean, the thing is, we're in a situation where the first things that are released are basically for gamers because they'll plug straight into a games console or they'll plug straight into a powerful PC. Um, so if it's when are the first people going to get their hands on it and when are they going to go crazy for it? end of this year, probably beginning of next year. I mean, things will be out at the end of this year, but they'll get momentum come Christmas. Um, and they will tell other people. And, and, you know, if you haven't tried any kind of VR, please do. You'll either love it or hate it. I guarantee that you, you won't be indifferent to it. Um, and the thing is, they will tell other people. Um, and they will, where possible, they will hand it on. Now, the difference is between showing someone your 
fancy new smartwatch or whipping your phone out and saying, look at the resolution of this screen, whatever. That kind of sharing isn't there. You have to be wherever it's plugged into or whatever it's strapped onto. Um, so it won't pick up that momentum quite as fast because people will still need to see it and experience it to really get that taste. But you know, another three years down the line, it will be completely entrenched in what we do. And also it will be entrenched in more extras than upfront because it will be the film industry offering that as the way to immerse yourself for two or three minutes in the film with the characters. It won't replace the film. It will become the expected extra. So you still have three years to save money for your kids <laughs> for Christmas, you know. Final questions? No one? Oh, we have one at the back. It's going to be the last one, so you're the lucky one. Hi, um, I have a question because you keep talking about virtual reality, but uh, what, according to your, let's say, ideas, will come next? I mean, we've been hearing about kind of controlling using your brain waves or reproduction of smell. What do you think will be the next thing after the virtual reality kicks in? Well, the, see, the thing is that there's a, I mean, there's a company in Utah called The Void that's helping combine the two. So it's a little bit like the, the smell and the sense and, and the 4D experience. Um, so they're setting up a VR theme park where you get to run around and if you run into the wall, it's your own fault because you would have seen a virtual wall in front of you. Um, but they'll spray water vapor and they'll put in smells and they'll rumble things so that it feels like you're vibrating. All of that kind of thing, that sensory addition, um, yeah, that's kind of gonna, gonna happen. Um, do we want it? Do we need it? We don't need it. Um, some people will want it just to get the extra level of experience, but those kind of things are smaller and smaller bites of the audience, essentially, because I can still live without a phone that delivers smells to me, and I can still live without something that replicates the surface of you know the tree bark in the middle of the the Amazon. Um, so when we get that fully immersive experience, VR is just a vehicle to get us somewhere where we're not. Um, anything else that adds addition to that is, is brilliant. Um, the augmented reality does help as well because, um, again, Microsoft are looking at things where they'll augment content that sits on a screen, so it's not just something that's here or fully immersive, it will add something else within the room. Um, but yeah, the, beyond that, it will be things that are directly implanted in our heads. So um, I wouldn't worry too much about that yet, but it's going to happen. <laughs> Eventually. <Yeah. laughs> okay, well, we're out of time. Uh, Dean, it's been an incredible pleasure. Massive applause for Dean and his talk. Thank you very much. Guys, thank you very much for attending.